To what degree can you say something is always and everywhere and at all times evil? On the one hand, it's troubling if we cannot say that. If we cannot say certain acts are and always will be evil in themselves, then it's troubling. Is rape not always evil? Is torture not always evil? You know, now I know <laughs> that would prompt a lively discussion now, and we won't get into the those memos. But, uh, but uh, uh, you know, is the launch of nuclear war always evil? If we can cannot say that. But there are certain things which are and always and everywhere wrong. How can we respond to the totalitarian society which goes over the abyss? That, that, that's the troubling part. It is troubling, and I think there's no way of uh, uh, dealing with it as an abstract proposition. I, I think you have to say, as far as I can see, Given my experience, the experience of other Christians, the experience of the church, these things are wrong and will continue to be wrong. And I can't imagine circumstances in which it will be different. But I think that desire for certainty, which every human being has, is less important than the desire for understanding. And I think one must try to understand why something is wrong and why it might change in some cases, not in all cases. But <coughs> having seen these monumental changes in uh, the way the whole finances of a community are uh, arranged, or the way that all labor in the community is arranged. Um, I think one has to be very cautious of being absolutely certain of any particular proposition. But one can certainly have the practical certainty that in one's own lifetime, uh, this is uh, a moral judgment that won't change. Justice Dunan wrote his dissertation on usury, as I, and uh, I always have a theory that for many students, the dissertation is a is a lifelong project. They have a, a hidden question in was was did you pick usury because it was an acceptable question at that time to get at this question of change? No, I, I didn't really think of it that way. I had. Uh, it read, I, I thought of it, why I got into it, I thought of it as a challenge to uh, what I had understood growing up as a Catholic was Catholic doctrine, that morals never change. And I read these articles that said, well, it did change. And I thought, was well, that true? And so uh, I set out to investigate that question, did it change? Uh, not with the idea of uh, justifying change, but just to, to, to see if it actually happened. Well, actually, I have been in conversations about change in doctrinal development in the church where people, knowing of your book but not knowing what was in it, have said, well, can you name me any big changes where there have occurred? And that's actually, I think for many of us, that is a, a signal contribution of the book that now we have four significant areas where we can cite very quickly moral theology, which brings us to religious freedom. Uh, when John Courtney Murray was writing on religious freedom, he went to great lengths to propose that his constitutional approach to the question of religious freedom, that is, the government had not the rightful power to intrude on the conscience of the individual or the life of the believing community in its religious uh, legitimate religious autonomies, um, that he regarded that as a recovery of an earlier tradition in the life of the church, rather as something new. But of course, in part he did that because he knew it would be easier for the church to accept if it thought of it as a recovery rather than as something new. And in very many ways it was something dramatically new. So, uh, and you treat of this in your chapter, 
Do you regard the doctrine of religious liberty as fundamentally a new thing in the life of the church or something which was a recovery of an earlier tradition? Well, I think um, at the beginning and certainly in the uh, first 300 years when Christianity was not established but rather persecuted, it's pretty clear that Christians regarded the act of faith as a free act. Well, they couldn't have compelled it. They didn't have the mechanism to compel it. And so, uh, perhaps naturally, they thought, well, the only way you can come to receive the faith is by a free act. And that experience that one becomes a believer by freely accepting belief, uh, I think was the dominant tradition uh, throughout. Uh, belief is a free act. But once the uh, governmental uh, mechanism was in control of the Christians, a very uh, significant uh, exception developed. Uh, if you are baptized as a Catholic, and deviate from the faith. You've done something sinful, and you're subject to coercion. And uh, that view really begins with Constantine and the ch church is established. It's applied uh, vigorously in the fourth century against the Donatists, who uh, had strayed from uh, orthodoxy. And, uh, Tragically, and most significantly, it was endorsed by St. Augustine, who said that it works. You beat these people, you give them a good beating, they'll come back. He was looking at the peasants of North Africa. So uh, Augustine endorsed uh, coercion, and of course the next step, as it eventually turned out, was to endorse killing the heretic. So a long tradition was established of using force to compel belief. And it's only in the past century that the church recognized religious liberty for all. And again, it is Vatican II, the final session of Vatican II, that recognized uh, religious liberty. Right. And I, as you know, it was really the occasion for Marcel Lefebvre and those schismatics to leave the church because it was too much for them. Lefebvre. Lefebvre said, if the church is saying that, it's saying today what it said was false a hundred years ago. The church can't do that. Marcel was very uh, sincere. He couldn't grasp the fact that this kind of change would occur. And so he and his allies departed. Now that a few of them are being taken back, I don't know whether they'll have to uh, accept this doctrine, but suppose they did. Well, that brings us to the point, how should the church react to such fundamental change? That is, there is a great tendency and it was, a, it was a very present in the last pontificate when uh, Pope John Paul II would apologize for things. He would apologize for Galileo or for the Holocaust. Many within the Vatican um, were upset at so many apologies. Partly they thought that it diminished the stature of the apologies, but more importantly, not diminish, diminish the, the teaching authority of the church. And the church tends to react, as you said they did in, in, in your book, when they changed the teaching on slavery, the document basically points to, as we've said all along, slavery is wrong. And there's a great tendency to do that. How should the church confront its own change in doctrine? And is that error? Is that deepened insight, we, we'd all like to call our errors, I think, deepened insights, but but how how should the church think about this as you've reflected 